Great. Thank you very much, Olga. I really want to appreciate, uh, thank you for, for, first of all, setting up this wonderful series and for particularly in particular for inviting us to present. So today I'll tell you something a little bit off topic, I think a little bit different topic, uh, which is fluorescent nanodiamonds as developed for latent fingerprint detection. Um, and I want to say this is really the work of Hak Sung Jung, my, my co-author, um, who will be here, here to answer questions and, and uh, engage with you if you have questions for him. Uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, so I want to start with a brief outline. So first I'll tell you a little bit about fingerprint detection. Um, and then I'll tell you the, the, the uh, process that Haksung came up with, which is coding fluorescent nanodiamonds with polyvinyl pyrrolidone or PVP. Um, and the whole process is really demonstrated here on the, on the right hand side. So we coat the fluorescent nanodiamonds with this PVP. We turn that into a powder and that powder then basically interacts with the residue of uh, latent fingerprint residue. This is the oils and, and, and grease in your finger uh, prints uh, to, to so-called develop the fingerprints. And we've taken advantage of the fact that the fluorescent nanodiamonds can emit in multiple channels. So either uh, green fluorescence or red fluorescence as a way of, of overcoming background. Um, and so I'll take you through this process, uh, how we go about uh, producing the, the PVP fluorescent nanodiamonds. We do some characterization to make sure that they're, they're actually working properly. Then I'll take you through the, the heart of actually how do you do fingerprint detection with them. Uh, we get high resolution, high sensitivity fingerprint detection. Uh, we can do this on multiple surfaces. And as I pointed out, uh, by look, using different colors, we can, uh, we can achieve background uh, reduction or, or, or elimination of background. So that's the outline. And you may question, how do we get to fingerprinting? So as Olga said, our lab is really focused on single molecule approaches. And that was really many years ago, uh, I, I thought that the fluorescent nanodiamonds would be a phenomenal tool as biological optical probes, both primarily for visualization uh, and also as it turned out for manipulation. And what I realized very quickly was that this really requires chemistry. And so we spent some time, I'm not a chemist, but I was fortunate to, to uh, track people like Haksang and other chemists who are real chemists. Um, so we worked a little bit on functionalization and encapsulation of fluorescent nanodiamonds. So in silica encapsulation and functionalization, polydopamine encapsulation and functionalization of fluorescent nanodiamonds. Um, and, and more recently, uh, a method to increase the, just the, the bare carboxylic acids on the functionalization of fluorescent nanodiamonds. And what this really allowed us to do was what I wanted to do was do imaging manipulation with fluorescent nanodiamonds. Um, so we've developed methods to do background free imaging via magnetic modulation. Uh, we've shown three dimensional high, high resolution, super resolution, three dimensional tracking of fluorescent nanodiamonds. And what this allows us to do is then produce probably the best uh, fiducial marker for super resolution microscopy. So in this work, uh, they actually held a microscope stage to better than two nanometer resolution for two weeks of continuous imaging. Uh, based upon the fluorescent nanodiamond tracking. And finally, more recently, we've shown you can optically trap fluorescent nanodiamonds. So more uh, recently, Haksung was really, Haksung Zhang, Dr. Haksung Zhang, um, was really the, the spearheading this in my lab, was really the only person working on the fluorescent nanodiamonds. And it turns out he had some background um, during his uh, PhD work uh, developing silica nanoparticles for latent fingerprint detection. Uh, this was the, the, the publication that rose from that. And he realized as he was working with the fluorescent nanodiamonds that perhaps they would be almost an ideal probe for fluorescent uh, for fingerprint detection. And so this work really all stems from Haksung. And if I, there's a lesson to be learned is that you should trust the people in your lab. Um, and this was really all from him. And, and I had all, all I really contributed was a good sense of letting him run with this project. So this is really all, all Haksung uh, put this together. So taking a step back, uh, fingerprints. Well, so we all know them from CSI or other, you know, crime shows. Uh, so it turns out they're formed in utero by about seven months. Your fingerprints are stable and they are with you for the rest of your life. And it's been recognized actually for thousands of years that fingerprints are unique identifiers. Um, this is a, a an ancient Chinese tablet from about a thousand BC. Um, this is an emperor's tablet, uh, identification tablet. On one side is his seal and on the other side is his fingerprint. And obviously now in today's era, our phones are unlocked with our fingerprints. Um, so it's clear that I did a unique identification for the last little more than hundred years that they've also been one of the primary sources of identification of in criminal cases. And there's a whole field developed to this, which is, you know, how do you understand, how do you quantify, how do you identify people via fingerprints? And what's emerged from this study is that there's essentially three levels of, of identification or three levels of, of detail that you can extract from fingerprints. So the first level is a sort of very gross architectural. Um, you have different sort of 
overall architectural patterns, so-called level one. And level two is now more details of these ridges. So these ridges are the ridges on your fingers um, that are left in a fingerprint. And it's this more microscopic, uh, more detailed level of analysis. This is what really gives you the uh, ability to identify uniquely a fingerprint. This is when you see a CSI file, or an FBI file. This is what they're looking for, these so-called uh, ridge endings, these bifurcations, lakes where the ridge opens and closes, an independent ridge, a very short independent ridge, a spur, and even you can have ridges across it across each other. And so this is the level of detail that is required. And about eight to 10 of these make a unique identification of, of a person's fingerprint based upon the number and where they are uh, within the fingerprint. And you can go even deeper. Uh, you can actually look within these ridges. You can see pores or very faint uh, sort of inner, inner pore material or scars or other uh, defects in this so-called level three. But level two is really what's required for, for unique identification of fingerprints. So how do we go about developing latent fingerprints? So late, by latent fingerprint, this is a fingerprint that's left on material or at a crime scene or, or uh, and what it comes from is basically our hands are covered in a variety of, of sweat material, um, primarily water, salts, amino acids, proteins, nonpolar lipids, other, other trace elements. And when we touch something, we leave that, that this, this sort of uh, this complex uh, latent print and the process of developing that is figuring out a way of finding something that binds to it that becomes visible. All of you are probably familiar with powder dusting. This is still the most common and widely adopted use where a powder is put down such that it interacts with these uh, the latent print and so it becomes visible. Um, there's a whole variety of different methods and reagents. Powder dusting, as I said, is still the most common. There's uh, an anhydrin solution is another approach, iodine or benzoflavine spray, cyanoacrylate esters, there's metal deposition, um, probably many of you are familiar with the cyanocrate. This is the, the crazy glue uh, uh, fuming, uh, which is a very po popular technique. Again, you see this with, with UV light and CSI or crime shows. And more recently, uh, Hak Sung and others have been developing improved fluorescent staining, uh, and primarily through nanoparticles. So this is uh, earlier, Hak Sung's earlier work, fluorescent silica nanoparticles. People are using rarer fluorescent nanomaterials and even quantum dots as a way of, of basically producing a powder dusting with much enhanced with fluorescent approaches rather than simply scattering or, or absorption. Nonetheless, there's still uh, a, a need for improved particles. And so I'll sort of take you through the list of what makes a perfect particle detection for latent fingerprint uh, detection. So first of all, you, you want a broad applicability. It has to work on a variety of different surfaces, obviously. Uh, fingerprints and crime scenes are on all sorts of different materials. And this could be achieved perhaps through particle surface modification. You want very high contrast so that the, you need very good contrast of, of, the, of the friction ridges of the, of the fingerprint against the background. Um, and this can be achieved through uh, fluorescence intensity, through photoluminescence intensity, and possibly background suppression. You want very high selectivity. Once again, you want very high binding to the, for the friction regions and no other places. Uh, low toxicity. These are being used in crime scenes by non-specialists typically, so you worry about the toxicity of these powders. Um, so you really want something that's biocompatible and um, with also biocompatible surface modification. This is the, probably the, some of the problems with some of the rare earth approaches from the quantum dot approaches. These are known toxic materials. You also want low background, low interference, um, once again through, through the enhancement of uh, photoluminescence intensity or background suppression would be ways of improving them. Uh, should be permanent and stable. So you'd like something that could be gone back to over and over and over again. So both optically and mechanically stable particles. And finally, there are some instances where you would want multimodal or multi-scale imaging, for example, optical and even EM imaging of the same particles. So for people in the audience, many of you will come to the same conclusion that the Haxon came to was that perhaps nanodiamonds, all these points in red, I think are really beautiful illustrations of, of the power, the, you know, the, the incredible properties of fluorescent nanodiamonds. So I don't think for this crowd we need to spend much time on this, but what I will say is, you know, what we're doing in, in all of the work in the lab, we're taking this beautiful quantum mechanical system, and Ola's had many speakers in this series tell you about the quantum mechanical properties and wonderful things that this can you do primarily with this nitrogen vacancy center. And what I like to say is we take this, this beautiful quantum mechanical system and we turn it into a flashlight. So we're interested primarily in the fact that these, that these systems don't bleach. So unlike conventional fluorophores that either bleach or blink over time, Fluorescent nanodiamonds are perfectly stable. So the intensity is, is effectively uh, perfectly stable. There's very little blinking or bleaching. There's no bleaching, 
very little intensity fluctuations over time. And in fact, this is indefinite. So if you compare you know, fluorescent nanodiamonds of various sizes against an alexafluor, alexafluor goes bleaches and eventually, sorry, blinks and eventually bleaches. Um, other attractive properties of the fluorescent nanodiamonds are the fact that they emit in this sort of near IR window. This is good for imaging through tissue or other background material. And another background uh, suppression technique is the fact they have very long uh, excited state lifetimes. And so most background fluorescence tends to be prompt. So another way of, of rejecting background is by, by exciting the time resolved uh, uh, source and then doing delayed uh, uh, emission detection. But these properties of fluorescent nanodiamonds, in particular, the fact that they're essentially indestructible, they have very long, uh, indefinite uh, fluorescence lifetime. These are really the things that gave us uh, the hope or gave Haxong the hope that this would be a great tool for fluorescent, for uh, fingerprint detection. Um, moreover, so once again, we're focused, you know, most of the work or a lot of the work is focused on NB minus centers, but it turns out there's a whole host, there's a whole zoo of different uh, color centers in, in, in nanodiamonds that span almost the entirety of the visible region into the near IR region. And so this gives us opportunity of doing multiple wavelengths, sometimes even in the same particle, as I'll, as I'll show you later. Um, so that was the sort of Haxung's idea. Can we take these fluorescent nanodiamonds that have such perfect utility for this process? Can we turn them into an actual uh, process to, to develop latent fingerprints? And the approach he took was, was to uh, coat them with polyvinyl perilidone or PVP. And the process is to coat them with this polymer then dry them down to a powder, it's a free flowing powder. He applies the powder to the latent fingerprint, which then binds to the, the latent fingerprint material. And then once again, we can take advantage of the fact that diamonds are emitting in multiple fluorescent channels to do uh, different emission and excitation uh, detection, thereby allowing us to overcome background if that's an issue. So this is the overview. Let me walk you through this in a little more detail. So the first step is this uh, PVP coating. So PVP is an amphiphilic molecule. Um, there's a highly polar amide group in the ring here. And then as this forms into a polymer, you get uh, non-polar moieties, methene and methine, meth methene groups that form along the chain. And this gives it an amphiphilic behavior. These are known to stabilize nanoparticles. That's one of the primary uses is just to stabilize nanoparticles in solution um, by a steric hindrance of these polymeric chains. They're also non-toxic and approved for use in humans. This is important. Um, they're a binder in pharmaceuticals. They're in uh, the disinfectant. Betadine is actually just a complex between PVP and iodine that forms spontaneously. Um, and there are many consumer products, contact lenses, eye drops, toothpaste, shampoo, you name it. It's been, so they're very, it's a, it's, it's a well-tested, non-toxic, human-approved uh, 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 molecule. And ironically, so this amphiphilic behavior also enhances adhesion to different surfaces. In fact, this is the property that we're hoping will be, will be useful for uh, latent fingerprint detection. And that this PVP polymer enhances interactions with fingerprint residue, water, salts, proteins, and lipids. And the actual coding process this is an important aspect, I think, of you know, all this research is do something that other people can do. And I think this is a master. Haxon has been a master coming up with very simple, very easy to, to apply approaches. Um, so the coating itself is remarkably simple. You basically mix the fluorescent nanodiamonds. In this case, these are 50 nanometer fluorescent nanodiamonds with about a five-fold excess of 29 kilodalton PVP. This is 16 hour spontaneous reaction in ethanol. You uh, centrifuge, clean it up a few times, dry and vacuum, and you have a free-flowing PVP powder. So that's the process. Now I'll take you through a little bit of the characterization to make sure we're actually doing what we say we're doing. So first of all, uh, we can do FTIR to verify the PVP coding of the FND surface. So shown in black is the FTIR spectrum of PVP alone. And there's characteristic bands at about 2950, 1655, 1460, 1421, uh, and 1018 are the ones I'll, I'll focus on. In pink is the FTIR spectra of bare fluorescent nanodiamonds. Um, this has been well characterized by, by several groups. I won't focus on the nanodiamond peaks, but what I, what I will focus on is the unique peaks we see when we coat fluorescent nanodiamonds with PVP. And you can see that this strong 2950 band, this extremely strong 1655 band, the bands at 1460, 1421, and 1018 all come up. And these correspond to unique signatures of the PVP, um, a CH, uh, asymmetric stretch. The 1655 is a CO stretching vibration, and the 1460, 1421 are the, from the perinolinal group. And finally, the 1018 is a unique CN vibration that we get 
uh, from the PVP and wouldn't be in the diamond, nano diamonds themselves. So that's good evidence that we've, we've attached the PVP to the fluorescent nano diamonds. The next question is how do they behave in solution? And as I said, the PVP coating is known to improve the stability of nanoparticles. And what we see is that the bare fluorescent diamonds, even though the, the, the nominal diameter is about 50 nanometers, left in solution without sonication or anything else, they tend to aggregate. And so by, by FCS, or sorry, by uh, DLS, we see the size is more like about 140 nanometers. And importantly, there's a fairly large polydispersity index. So there's a very broad distribution of sizes. If we sonicate them and add PVP, then what we find is even if they're sitting around, they tend to stabilize at a much smaller diameter and importantly, a much smaller polydispersity index. So they're, they're remaining dispersed in solution. And if we measure the zeta potential, we see there's a very slight decrease or increase in the zeta potential, um, but probably indicating that the at, at, at the neutral pH, this is done at pH 7.5, that the PVP really isn't changing the, the intrinsic charge state of the diamonds all that much. So it's essentially going on as a neutral polymer. And we can look in more detail uh, if we do EM now of these same uh, either bare or PVP coated uh, diamonds. And once again, we see this dramatic increase in dispersibility or, or disaggregation. So bare fluorescent nanodiamonds in EM tend to clump or aggregate. Um, once again, the other thing that about this, I think it's really good to, you know, we have this image of these diamonds, these, these perfect little crystals. Um, and in EM, I think it's important to show that really we're dealing with sort of shards or, or chunks of these, of these, of these diamonds. Um, however, when we add the PVP, what we find is they're very well dispersed in the EM grid. You see these very nicely these are isolated, um, non-aggregated diamonds. Um, so the PVP, I think, is, is, is doing what, as, as advertised, uh, we're coating the diamonds and we're seeing that it's stabilizing them in solution. So the other important consideration, as I mentioned, some of these uh, you know, nanoparticles tend to turn out to be toxic. And this is a consideration for people trying to use this in the actual field. And so we wanted to have a look and uh, determine, are there any toxicity issues? This has been well established for bare nanodiamonds. We wanted to recapitulate that, that data and also show that the, the PVP are also non-toxic. So at the cellular level, we're looking at the viability of mouse immature bone marrow dendritic cells. These are very sensitive cells to perturbation. And also because of course, this is gonna be turned into a powder that will be used by people you worry about inhalation. And so we specifically chose human non-small lung carcinoma cells, that's H1299 cells, as a representative of, of lung cells. You know, are there particular uh, damage that could take place in lung cells? And what we find is we measure viability of these cells, either through a long incubation, a variety of concentration of nanoparticles, or a fixed concentration over a function of time. What we see is that either uh, fluorescent nanodiamonds on their own, this is the uh, pink, and red uh, triangles in the two cell types, um, or the PVC, PVP uh, fluorescent nanodiamonds in, in sort of the, the teal and dark blue. So there's really no significant reduction in viability, either as a function of concentration or time. Whereas if we take another commonly used nanoparticle, quantum dots in both cell types, we see a fairly rapid decrease in cell viability over concentration and time. So once again, the take home message is that the fluorescent nanodiamonds either coated with PVP or bare really pose no toxic threat at the level of the cells. Another concern, you know, so I would say cell viability is a, is a base level uh, concern you have. Another concern would be uh, immune response. And once again, the possibility of inhaling these um, and, and eliciting immune response would be a concern. And so here, in particular, the bone marrow, the, the mice-derived uh, immature bone marrow dendritic cells are very sensitive to immunogenic uh, substances. They have a, a high concentration of uh, amino receptors on their surface, and they respond very quickly by releasing the cytokine TNA alpha. So they're a very sensitive probe for immunogenic uh, processes. And what we find is if we treat them with a control of PBS, then we see the background level of T this is a TNF alpha. This is the cytokine, the amino response of cytokine. Uh, either bare or PVP coated diamonds elicit no uh, higher levels of, of TNF alpha. Whereas once again, quantum dots have a marked increase in TNF alpha. This is significant at the one percent level. So again, the take home from these two studies is that the PVP and bare diamonds are both safe as a, in terms of cell viability, so they're not killing the cells. And more importantly, in a more subtle measure, they are not eliciting an immune response from the same cells. 
Um, so suggesting that at least at the cellular level, these are safe and non-toxic and non-perturbative biologically. Good, so finally, we can come back now to the sort of question at hand, which is the optical properties. So the PVP coating has very little effect on the FND optical particles. This is to be expected, this is more or less a transparent polymer. What we see in the absorption spectra is a very slight increase down here, the UV, and that's primarily due to the PVP on its own, has, a, has an absorption peak of about 180 nanometers, and we see that added to the fluorescent nanodiamond, but out at sort of visible wavelength, there's no real change in the absorption profile. And uh, we see almost a perfect uh, overlap in the emission in the photo photoluminescence uh, emission profile of either coated or bare fluorescent nanodiamonds. Um, and again, this has been touted repeatedly, but it's always good to measure as we find that the, the photostability of bare or PVP coated diamonds is far superior to quantum dots. Um, so here, this is a continuous illumination at uh, 320 nanometer light, and we're monitoring the intensity normalized to this first point. And what we see is either the bare or coated fluorescent nanodiamonds go on for you know, hundreds of minutes, whereas quantum dots, which have been touted as unbleachable or, or very long lifetime, what we find is after about not quite an hour, they're starting to bleach significantly. And by two hours, they're really, you know, they're very, very significantly bleached. Um, once again, highlighting the, the incredible durability and stability, optical stability of the fluorescent nanodiamonds. And as I mentioned previously, fluorescent nanodiamonds can, can actually emit with, can have different centers. Um, and this particular batch of fluorescent nanodiamonds um, ended up with probably at least three different centers. So probably down here at about 525, this is an H3 center. Um, there's the NB0 and NB minus center. And by changing what this, you can sort of see from this graph is that by changing both the excitation and emission filters, we can selectively uh, capture light from these three different uh, centers. And we'll come back to this later, but this is just a, a uh, sort of a highlight of one of the other unique uh, features of the fluorescent nanodiamonds is the fact that they can possess multiple fluorescent centers. And even, uh, for example, the NB minus or NB zero, a very broad emission um, that gives us our aspects or abilities to reduce background. Good. So now that we have particles, they're well behaving, they're coated with PVP, they're uh, in principle not toxic, um, and they have very, they're very good optical properties. How do we actually go about this? So once again, we coat the fluorescent nanodiamonds with this PVP polymer. We dry this down to a powder. It's a free flowing powder. The, the polymer helps uh, prevent aggregation and clumping. And the actual measurements are done by uh, first taking two cover glass held next to each other. I think it was just thin glass. And a donor places a, a fingerprint at that junction between the two. And this allows us to do as a direct comparison of the same fingerprint, sort of left-hand side, right-hand side, and these first set of experiments are just asking the question, does PVP really enhance this process? So on the left-hand side, we'll treat these with just bare fluorescent nanodiamonds. And on the right-hand side, this PVP coated fluorescent nanodiamonds. And shown below are three replicates of the same fingerprint across these two slides. On the left-hand side, in each case, is the bare diamonds. On the right-hand side is the PVP coated diamonds. And we're doing two different uh, measurements here. So the daylight, this is just uh, ambient exposure ambient light and taken with a, a consumer uh, digital SLR. Um, so you can see the resolution is quite high, even with such a simple camera. On the right-hand side, this is done with a simple CCD camera with a emission filter and excitation filter. So in this case, uh, the excitation is about 500 nanometers and we're looking in the, in the red channel. And what you can see in all three of these cases is that the right-hand side, the PVP coated diamonds are far superior in, in capturing the fingerprint impression. So this gave us some hope. And now Haxong recruited, uh, I'm sorry, another test. So, you know, those look great. How do they do against a commercial powder? And so here, this is a commercially available fingerprint dusting powder. This is a sort of a challenging fingerprint. It's the same fingerprint, two pieces of glass, two fingerprints from exactly the same time, the same donor. And what you can see on the left is that the commercial dusting powder does a relatively poor job of capturing the fingerprint. You can see the, the ridges are there, but certainly in not great detail. On the right-hand side, it's the exact same fingerprint on, on a, a duplicate glass captured with the diamond PDP. Um, so, so far superior capturing of, of the fingerprint. So this process is equally as good, if not better, than, than at least this, this particular uh, commercial dusting uh, powder. So Haxong recruited three donors um, just to sort of show that this is not 
a particular, you know, it's not a one-off. You can see there's very high resolution. And I'd like to say now that the members of the lab, they're, they're any, any future crime uh, uh, career is now ruined. Their fingerprints are widely available on the internet. So, uh, but uh, and we can see from these images, we can see the sort of high level architectural details. But as I mentioned previously, the real the distinction that you need to be able to find are these so-called level two details. And that really allows you to give 100% identification of these fingerprints. So this is donor one. And now if we zoom in on this, um, what I'm showing you, so there's, this is an independent ridge. This is a zoom in on that. So this is this green line marks the independent ridge. This is one of these level two features. There's a few more of these independent ridges we can find in this fingerprint. Uh, there's actually several bifurcations. So this is a point where the two ridges separate. Um, you can find an example there. And in fact, there's numerous examples across this fingerprint of these bifurcation events taking place. Uh, we also find an ending ridge. So this is where a ridge ends abruptly. And so there's a couple examples of that. Another one is here. There's one more where the ridge just ends. And finally, there's an example of a lake. So this is where the ridge opens up and then reseals. And finally, there's even a, an example of a crossover. So the two ridges cross over. As I mentioned, you need about eight to 10 of these uh, so-called level two features to make 100% identification of a fingerprint. So here we have on order 20 of these features. This is, would be an absolute perfect fingerprint for identification purposes. So once again, donor one, your life in crime is ruined. You have no future in crime. Uh, and just to show that this is not a one-off, these are another two donors. Uh, we can see again, uh, very easily distinct, so the, the ability to distinguish these ending ridges, these independent ridges, bifurcations, and, and even another lake. So once again, we can, these, uh, the quality of these images are such that we can make 100% uh, identification of these fingerprints at the level of sort of FBI kinds of uh, uh, distinction. And we can go even further. Um, so now for even higher resolution, this is SEM imaging. As I, as I showed you previously, the diamonds have, have electron contrast. And so uh, these were done on ITO glass and then you could actually image these. So once again, at very high resolution, you can see these features are now incredibly obvious. This is a bifurcation event. Uh, this is a termination an independent ridge and another bifurcation event um, shown here. So this provides, so that you can do multiple uh, analysis of fingerprints with the, uh, the uh, PVP FNDs. Good. So another aspect, of course, this was all done on glass. That's sort of a very, it's a non-porous, easily uh, you know, tracked or, or easily developed substrate. And of course, in a real crime scene, you wanna know how well does this do on a number of different substrates. And the, the, the primary distinction is, are they porous or non-porous? So as examples of non-porous substrates, aluminum foil, ceramic, glass, and plastic. And uh, those are distinguished from porous, which would be pay, uh, money, paper, and wood. And as I mentioned previously, so what you're looking at is in daylight, this is just a, 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 a ambient light picture with a, with a, a digital SLR. And then we can use a, a CCD camera equipped uh, with emission filters, either in the green or the red, exciting either in the blue or in the green. And what you'll see is it across all of these different uh, surfaces with varying degrees of sensitivity, uh, we can pick up the, the fingerprint impression, the latent fingerprint after developing with the PVP diamonds. And once again, you can see under certain conditions, one versus one wavelength versus the other does slightly better. So this ability to use different wavelengths really allows us to overcome the background or some of the, uh, the issues of these different surfaces. But the important take home is that we can always distinguish these, these, uh, these details across different surfaces. Uh, even things like money and paper, which can be hard to, to identify, but given the porous nature. Um, good. Um, and just again, just to show that this is reproducible, this is one person who donated five different fingerprints. Um, all five fingers were, were very easily matched. Um, all five fingers were very easily, easily recovered. So just sort of building up the statistics, we're not, we're not sure. There's no cherry picking. It works uh, uniformly well across different fingers, across different donors. Um, another issue that arises when you're doing this in the field is you know, what I've been showing you is, is fingerprints that were developed uh, the day of or you know, within an hour of, of actually being deposited. Um, of course, that's not always the case in reality. And so one thing that happens is these complex fluids, this complex material that make up the latent fingerprint 
age and degrade over time. So the question is what happens after you know, three or seven days of, of degradation? You can see there is uh, some signal loss. However, the overall uh, resolution and imaging remains quite good enough to make a, a distinction. So even after seven days of aging, uh, this, the, 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 the nanodiamond PVP can pick up these, these, these very sensitive features. The point I'll, I'll, I'll make, you know, one question we've had, um, you know, obviously the flesh and nanodiamonds are, are uh, the price is coming down, thanks in, in part to Olga's uh, work and other, uh, other developments. And, you know, one, people have asked, like, how much does it cost to, to do this, right? Is this an expensive, is this a feasible approach? And Haxon worked very hard to figure out that each fingerprint requires a little less than 100 micrograms of material. And when we go through the math, it works out to about a few, about a few dollars per fingerprint. So it's not it's not uh, super cheap, but it's not doesn't break the bank. So even though these are diamonds, it's uh, not all that expensive to make a diamond fingerprint. Um, and finally, um, you know, one of the, the things that Hexon was really fascinated, I think, was was the ability to reduce background. Um, and so one approach was, as I mentioned, this sort of dual mission. And just to, to, to demonstrate this, um, he added a background of either red quantum dots, Nile red, or in fact, uh, took a, an impression of a latent fingerprint on orange paper. All of these give very strong fluorescent background. And what we can see in the case of the red dyes, um, if we excite in the blue and, and record in the green, we see there's virtually no, uh, no background whatsoever. We've eliminated this, this you know, large background. Whereas if we excite in the green and uh, detect in the red, we see this huge background. And so this is just a, a concrete demonstration. This is dual imaging, uh, dual color imaging gives us a, a powerful way of producing the background. Converse, conversely, on the orange paper, if we uh, excite in the blue and, and record in the green, we have very low contrast. And uh, if we excite in the, in the green and record in the red, we have very high contrast. So once again, just eliminating the background by, by judicious choice of, of different colors. And you can imagine ultimately uh, combining you know, different wavelength detections to really enhance the signal and, and reject background. So with that, uh, I've reached uh, the end. So hopefully I've, I've managed to convince you that we've successfully coded the FNDs with PVP. Uh, the PVP coding improves development of, of the latent fingerprints and also just in general improves the, the stability and, and uh, disaggregation disaggregates the FNDs in general. Um, we've shown that we can extract these so-called level two features from latent fingerprints developed using the PVP coded FNDs. And this, as I said, these level two features are what gives you absolute confidence in, in identifying fingerprints. Um, the uh, Making it more practical, we've shown that these latent fingerprints can be visualized with PVP coded diamonds on numerous substrates, both porous and non-porous. Um, and here, taking advantage of the fact that the, the diamonds are incredibly stable, so the fingerprints developed with PVP coded uh, FNDs were independent of source, so donors, different fingers, and importantly, age. And what I didn't show you was um, if you develop these and let them sit for full 10 months, we came back and looked at them again, and they were barely changed. And so that's a highlight, I think, of these of the, of the diamonds is they're perfectly stable through time. So once you've developed these, they're perfectly stable. And um, finally, the diamonds by uh, imaging multiple, multiple modes. And once again, this takes advantage of the stability. So we can really image this for long periods of time, um, really taking advantage of this, this indefinite optical stability of the fluorescent nanodiamonds allows us to uh, reject the background fluorescence by either dual or even or multiple uh, excitation and emission wavelength imaging. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who helped with the work. So the Laboratory of Single Molecule Biophysics, um, these are the current members who were members actually who were here when, when Haksung was doing this work. Uh, we had also had help in the, from the, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute members, Dr. Marie Paul Strub. Um, I'd particularly like to highlight Dr. Wolf Swenson in the uh, Imaging Pro Development Center who's worked on a lot of the nanodiamond projects with us. Someone who's really been uh, helping spearhead the, the projects here and his, uh, his colleague, uh, Dr. Hightower Well. And finally, the, the, a number of the measurements were performed in the biophysics core facility and the electron microscopy core facility uh, assisted Haxon with the EM. Um, our collaborator uh, in the Korean National Police University, someone who's actually interested in using and developing these uh, nanodiamonds for actual work on, on detecting uh, uh, 
fingerprints, is Professor uh, Seung Jung Ru. Uh, we had help from NCATS doing the FTIR uh, collaboration in through NCI, looking at the cellular response to, to fluorescent nanodiamonds. The uh, formerly anonymous fingerprint donors who have now lost their future in crime. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, as I said, this is really work all done by Hak Sung Jung. Um, he should take the credit for this. It was really his idea. Um, the paper is here. I should have mentioned this is published uh, in 2020. Um, the, 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 the paper is here. And if you have any questions, you want to contact either one of us. Our emails are here. This scan will tell you, take you to the website. This will take you to the paper. And with that, I'll finish. Uh, thank you for your attention and ask if there's any questions. Uh, uh, Kirk Hexong, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Uh, I'm sure you had a lot of fun working on this project. <laughs> and uh, now we are open for questions. Please uh, just unmute yourself and ask your question or type it in a chat room. And uh, so far, I would like to start with my question. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, how critical is size of nano diamonds? We you know the larger diamonds, the brighter its intensity, emission intensity. So uh, probably some specific question, what is the feature size of those specific level two features? Uh, so that say larger than 50 nanometers, more bright diamonds can be applicable for this application. Haksung, do you want to weigh in on yeah. that? I can, I can, I'll move back to the slides. I think the EM probably gives us a clear indication. Yes, yeah, right. Sort of that. So yeah. it's about not quite 100 nanometers, give or take. I think between 100, 150 nanometers up to 200 nanometers is sort of the size of those those ridges. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's, uh, sorry, microns, not nanometers, microns. Um, so it's a micron scale. Mm -hmm. Microns. Ooh, yeah, ooh, microns. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so it's, it's, so I think uh, 50 nanometers is probably, you know, overkill in some sense. Um, I'm guessing, you know, probably, you know, hundreds of nanometers would be fine. Uh, Haksung, do you have a? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think uh, the size of uh, FND is not a is not a important uh, point. So I think uh, we can use also micro size fluorescent diamond. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, another question is uh, related to suitability of blue uh, fluorescent nano diamonds. Uh, do you see? Uh, if adding an extra color like blue emission uh, to the palette uh, of diamonds available for this application, does it bring any value? Uh, I'll, I'll start, I'll let Haksung sort of take this, but I would imagine <laughs> so you could even, you know, so we took advantage, as you well know, I think the, at least my sense is making the diamonds is more of an art or as much art as science, and you never quite know what you're going to get. And so this particular batch of diamonds had sort of these three centers. We, we really relied, I would say, on two of them. Um, you could imagine either adding a, another color to, to the same diamonds, or in fact, using an admixture of diamonds, right? So another way to do this would be to choose, if you have blue fluorescent mm -hmm. diamonds, green, red, mix them together. Um, I think they would label all equally as well. I think the more colors, the, the better the background rejection would be. So I think um, that's a, you know, a, that would be a, a great addition. And I think, you know, taking advantage of, of, of the fact that the diamonds, you know, they're all equally stable, the different colors will give you even better rejection of, of background. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we were lucky this particular batch had the same diamonds had had multiple centers, but you could use separate diamonds. Um, so I think a, an admixture of different diamonds would mm -hmm. actually be quite useful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add to that, Haksung. And the most important thing is uh, uh, brightness. So uh, I also use a ferroboskite nanocrystal to develop Rayton fingerprint. It's a very bright. It looks mm -hmm. uh, almost the same with the quantum dot. So mm -hmm. when I use a um, frost and nanodiamond and the 
perovskite nanocrystals, the acquisition uh, time is pretty different. So when I use a perovskite, it, it takes uh, within 10 or 15 seconds. But when I use a nanodiamond, 20 or 30 nanoseconds, 30 seconds. So I think uh, if you develop the process nanodiamond, nanodiamond to apply uh, uh, forensic science, hopefully I want to be very bright mm -hmm. to reduce the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time. maybe yeah. As you mentioned, one micron particles which are very bright can yes, be yes. a solution for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that would be an interesting, interesting approach because it's something you know we tend to focus on the very small diamonds for you know all of these these sort of biological applications. Mm -hmm. But I think that would be a really interesting application of of the very large, because, very bright because, diamonds. Uh -huh. And they would be by order of magnitude less expensive, so right. which would open the door for I say cost component. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, uh, that's an excellent point. Yep. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Uh, Olga, this is Gary. Uh, yes, Kier and Ha Sung, I um, want to commend you. Uh, you sort of anticipated all the issues and questions people would raise. And so very, very nice, thorough study. Uh, one question occurred to me when you were showing the uh, material, which I don't believe you identified, that's currently used. Mm -hmm. You. Um, showed the image quality wasn't quite as good. So uh, if, I don't know what's utilized in that case, but if it were used with the PVP, would you see more similar results? Uh, you, you obviously carefully selected the PVP. I wondered if it were used with other fluorophores that might produce higher quality results. I'll let uh, Hak Sung address that. I think this, Hak Sung actually first developed this for use with the silicon nanoparticles. And so he had this sort of, he already had the PVP sort of, I think, worked out. So I'll let Hak Sung address that question. Right. When I use a uh, fluorescent nano, uh, silicon nanoparticles, it's also very similar with uh, this, uh, uh, this research result. So that's why I use uh, PVP uh, coated fluorescent nanodiamond. So I think addressing your question, I think, uh, you know, the powders that exist, I think what people are doing is, is you know, trying to make very inexpensive, very efficient. And so it's just a, a fluorescent powder. It's commercial and, and protected. So we don't know really what it is. It's a green fluorescent powder. Um, I don't think it's a nanoparticle based. I think it's, well, at some level, it's going to be a particle. So it's, at some level, it's, you know, micron scale based um, particles. But I don't think there's, a, there's an explicit coding process that takes place. Um, and so you're absolutely right. You know, I think the PVP, what the what the what this work has shown me, Haksung's two, you know, two two forays into this field, um, or or now three, have shown that the PVP, I think, is a really powerful coating. You know, um, and I think that in of itself would improve things. I think you know, I think what Haksung brought to this, with respect to the nano diamonds in particular, is is they have some unique features um, that that could be applicable. Um, you know, this, this long lifetime um, and, you know, and, and, you know, another way that, you know, just sort of anecdotally, another way we can overcome background is that other fluorophores bleach. Um, and so if you're willing to be patient, you can just bleach other fluorophores away and the diamonds remain. Um, so that's, a, that's another approach that, you know, it's a sort of a brute force way of, of getting rid of background. Um. Here, I have, this is uh, Nicholas. I have a question and, and also the platform. Um, yeah, so a great talk, very interesting you know, application. Um, so I have a, your choice of using a powder, is that mostly because the traditional approach is to use a powder? Because I wonder if, you know, in terms of cost, could you not use something like a spray with particles suspended in it? Uh, because that would cut down on the use, the, you know, presumably the amount of kind of excessive waste, uh, maybe from a powder and get the cost down. And as kind of a second question, which I don't know, maybe you, I don't, I don't know that anyone here is an expert on the forensic 
analysis of crime scenes for sure, but um, like how much of a need, uh, you know, given I assume modern crime scene forensics is heavily reliant on, you know, particularly DNA analysis, like how much of a factor or how predominant is the use of this fingerprint analysis and kind of modern forensic analysis uh, as compared with you know, other techniques? So in, in investigating that, I can address the second question. I'll start and I'll, I'll turn it over to Haksang. In, in addressing the second question, I think DNA is certainly uh, on the rise in terms of importance, but, but remarkably, fingerprints remain the single most important crime scene evidence. Um, okay. And, and it, I, I imagine over time, it will be displaced by DNA. And in fact, uh, uh, Haksang's colleague in Korea at the, at, the, uh, at the police university is in fact, you know, what they're really aiming for are methods of, of extracting both fingerprints and DNA at the same time. Um, that's the idea. Um, but, but remarkably, fingerprints remain the primary source of, of crime scene evidence. Um, and, and as I said, DNA is, is becoming more important, but for the time being, at least, it remains, uh, remains fingerprints. All right, so, I'm sorry, I think... <laughs> You can probably address the questions of, of why a powder and not a not a spray. I think that's more in your your wheelhouse, Haksan. Oh, sorry. Why a, why a powder and rather than a spray? Right? Could you could you achieve similar results? Ah, yes, spray, yes, yes. Right? Uh, it's uh, relatively simple and efficient compared to other uh, developed methods. That's why most, lots of people want to use a uh, powder method to develop fingerprint detection. So some, some people want to use a spray type of developed material to detect fingerprint, fingerprint, written fingerprint, but uh, it need a more complicated uh, conditions to prepare the materials. And when I, uh, I also have experience to develop like a uh, same uh, method, but you have to, uh, carefully choose a solvent to make a spray. Like uh, if you use uh, ethanol, the fingerprint uh, disappears, di dissolve in ethanol or water. So it's very complicated. So it's not easy to make uh, prepare the conditions to perfect develop uh, latent fingerprint. And it, so maybe it is a follow-up question because now I because maybe my understanding is different. So uh, at a crime scene, are they when you say latent developing the fingerprint? So do they lift the fingerprint from the crime scene and then develop it at another site, or is it done on site? I guess that's yeah. Maybe that's the a more. So like is the is this development of fingerprints done at the crime scene or or do they somehow lift the fingerprints out of the crime scene or something? And I I don't know that part I maybe it's just not clear to me. My sense is it's done uh, directly. So either either the material is removed and and done in a lab, or if it can't be removed, it's done in situ on site. And so I think lifting sites is lifting prints is possible. But I think my understanding is that the very best resolution is done by, by capturing the, the print directly. Um, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have another question. Uh, uh, does it, uh, is, is it possible, and if there are unmet needs in the forensic, uh, say it um, uh, kind of to start to, to use um, nano diamonds as immobilization platform, say, for these uh, non-polar lipids, amine acids, proteins, which exist uh, on the fingerprint itself, so that then you can transfer them, and uh, probably they would adhere well to nanodiamonds, um, and we know that then can be further analyzed for identification of for example, if it was blood present, uh, and if blood is present, then probably DNA would present for sure. Uh, is it kind of possible to extend more uh, 
the job that uh, FND can perform uh, for forensic investigator. Of course, ideally, it would be great to use all these sensing properties of FND, right? So that you have some uh, platform uh, so that um, uh, modulating NV uh, fluorescence and uh, uh, learning something about biological environment would be ideal, of course. Did you think in that direction? And uh, do you have some so far just very general conceptual ideas for using either as uh, immobilization platform for biological features or even more over extending to sensing um, capacity of FND? So I can I can start and then I think Haksang knows more about this, but I know it turns out that the composition, so you know, I I I sort of glossed over this, but the composition of that latent fingerprint is actually also unique. So I think you're sort of onto something intuitive the, you know, what's happening is that it turns out the amino acid composition um, is sort of unique. So not only do you have a fingerprint, but if you could analyze the, 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 the molecular details of the residue, that also is unique among people. So for example, and very crudely, things change with, with the sex, with the age, with the, or the gender, with the age, uh, uh, and mm -hmm. you have specific changes, and then more details that sort of you could imagine, like a mass spec profile mm -hmm. of that pro of, of that of that uh, material would actually be another fingerprint of of the you know of, of the person. Um, that's a I don't I know there's a little bit of work people are trying to do with some of the sensing of some of the metabolites or or some of the some of the components of the residues. I think Haksung has a better better feel for what that is. Um, but certainly I think both of those would, I think would be worthwhile pursuing. One is, you know, if you could use the diamonds to essentially collect, you know, observe the print and then, and then use them as a carrier to pull things off and to actually analyze them after the fact. Mm -hmm. and, and ideally sensing, right, in situ, right? If you could sense a certain thing that would give you another dimension on, on which mm -hmm. you, could, you could analyze things. But I think Haksung has, has maybe better insights on this. Mm -hmm. Here, critically uh, um, point out the uh, fingerprint detection area. So uh, although you didn't recognize your behavior, lots of people touch their uh, face, right? Mm -hmm. So women have contained lots of cosmetic uh, component of their face, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, analyze the component of a uh, latent fingerprint, you can uh, determine the uh, men or women. So uh, when you uh, analyze the weight and fingerprint, you can determine the sexual component. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, I when Haksung mentioned that his colleague is interested in in you know capturing DNA, I, I was immediately thinking, right? Uh, you know, could you could you modify the diamonds in such a way that they could become, you know, specifically capture DNA, um, and then use that? So both analyze the print and then and then extract the diamonds, extract the DNA, um, and and you know do sequencing. Um, that's a you know I think mm -hmm. that would be a, a a fascinating approach to take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My colleague said uh, there's two big problem for detection of uh, latent fingerprint you, uh, with the uh, DNA. So the first one is uh, the material should be well interact with the DNA. But the other one is well release the DNA. Yes. <laughs> There's a critical point. Yep. To, okay. yeah, so to some sort of what you want almost then is some sort of reversible, mm -hmm. right? Something reversible chemically or, yes. or, or physically reversible mm -hmm. right. interaction. Yes, uh -huh. right. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Oton Monteiro speaking. Uh, and uh, if I may, I have a couple of questions that kind of drive a little bit of, uh, to a different uh, topic here, but uh, it's uh, related to the uh, first the stability of this PVP. What kind of temperatures you can tolerate with that? And I'm thinking about using that coated material for different applications. And then the other thing too is that uh, 
carbon dots are also would be also some you know other possibility for the same similar applications that we're looking at it. So and, and there are right now you no know, techniques that at least in principle could make uh, significantly cheaper than the nanodiamond uh, material. Uh, so in that case, I mean, why, I mean, is there any particular reason why you steer away from that? And then the temperature stability of the PVP. And also if you have worked with PVP on uh, carbon dots. I will turn the PVP questions over to Haksang. He's really the expert on PVP. So Haksang. <laughs> yes. Um, because uh, the PVP is biocompatible and you can easily purchase and low price. So it has very, uh, it has uh, large uh, benefit mm -hmm. to use them. And okay. we can, okay. yeah, we can also uh, control the molecular weight of PVP. And hmm. so- but, uh, And do you know that, I think the specific question was the thermal, what's the thermal stability? Do you know what the thermal, uh, thermal stability? stability. Uh, yes, uh, I did a uh, thermal gluimetric analysis. Mm -hmm. So it it can be uh, destroyed from 200 over 236 degree. Okay. Yeah. I know one other commercial application is it's used in, uh, in in hot glue gun. The hot glue sticks actually have PVP as a component. Um, but okay. I think the Haksung's data is more, more relevant, but I just, I, I remember that. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, I think uh, your question about other other particles is, is certainly apt. I think, uh, you know, I think what Haksung was really aiming for was this notion of how to do multicolor and, and background subtraction. I think one of his, you know, his real hopes was, um, you know, we'd worked on on this sort of magnetic uh, approach, this magnetic modulation approach of doing background subtraction. And I think his hope was to develop a system where you could do that. And that would be, I think, unique to the fluorescent nanodiamond. So that was part of the impetus for this. Um, we haven't developed that. that. That's something in the future. Um, it could be done uh, possibly, but but certainly I think it's not it's not unique. And and in some sense, it was a proof of principle. I think, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The diamonds are, are you know, uh, the cost is a little bit more, substantially more, but not outrageously more than the, than the commercial powders. Um, I, I certainly think that perhaps carbon dots, again, I think, you know, the things that we could take advantage of are the multiple colors, um, and obviously the stability and the size. Um, and those are, I think, the things that are really driving this to some extent. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, in the future, another very high resolution approach would be this sort of magnetic modulation that would do get rid of the background. Especially the carbon dust also uh, very weak uh, stability under continuous irradiation. I never seen high photo stability like a uh, diamond. Mm -hmm. so uh, and a also, it seems that uh, quantum dots have uh, uh, are prone to oxidation in air. So uh, it's another concern that even they are very bright, say in ideal conditions, mm -hmm. you cannot say preserve this for a long time. So at least what I've heard about yep. oxidation oh. of quantum dots. Was the question related to quantum dots or carbon dots? Carbon dots. Carbon dots. Yes. Right, and then we've used carbon dots in, say, long-term, uh, you know, photoluminescence applications, and and we we don't see much of a degradation, okay, uh, with, with those. So that's that's why. The, but but I mean I agree. I mean particularly if you could go into the larger size that Holger has suggested, then it's everything becomes much easier to yes. handle. Yes. So the you know, cost would probably go down significantly. Yeah. And, and it's uh, just even not size, it's just kind of market demands. Uh, if there is kilogram demand from the market, then 
definitely it's not a problem to deliver this kilogram and it will if it's constant demand the drop becomes uh, the cost drops 100 times yes mm -hmm. yes yep yep no i think that's an excellent point olga i think you know we we sort of develop what we had on hand but i think the larger particles would be both cheaper and also as to haxang's point the brighter particles i think really drive that sensitivity right and so if we had brighter mm -hmm. particles it could be shorter excitation or shorter shorter collection times and, and higher sensitivity. So I think I think that's a really that's that's a that's a really good idea. Here, this is Gary again. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides that it you need about eight markers. Um, I'm assuming, looking at the images that you've shown, that finding that many of many unique markers is relatively straightforward, but considering the billions of people in the world, is it ever necessary to go to a larger number of markers for unique identification? So I think my little, my, my brief sort of education on this topic, um, at least for the, so there's sort of FBI standards. And I think the FBI standards have declared that essentially eight to 10, because it's not only the markers, but the, the position of those markers. Um, and, and there's also, right, so that you can do an overall sort of gross analysis of that sort of highest level feature. And then within that, if you find eight to 10 of these, of these unique features that, and they can be quantified in terms of not just the feature existing, but obviously what's its location. Also things like its, its orientation, right? Its handedness, which way is it the angle? And so all of that can be extracted from, from these images. And there, the, 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 the you know, the, it's a, you know, it's not a proven fact, uh, but you know, you, you can ask the question. Even twins, so twins share only about thirty percent uh, overlap in their in their uh, in their fingerprints, um, and, and and it's quite interesting. I was reading about this that even so, in utero, when the fingerprints are forming, they're forming in in relation to sort of local cues. And as the amniotic fluid is moving and whatnot, that changes the, this is what actually produces these patterns. And so even twins have uh, largely distinguishable fingerprints. Um, and so the notion, that's where the sort of eight to 10 comes from, um, is that in, in, in the, at least all the cases that people have looked at in detail, that's about the level that you need to make an absolutely unique identification. If you consider the fact that it's not just which features do they have, but where are they in relation to each other? Where are they in relation to this larger sort of, uh, you know, profile? And then finer scale features, which I didn't didn't include, but you can sort of imagine, you know, what's the local, the, the, the details of these features? How long are they? What's their inclination? What's their angle with respect to each other? What's the spacing and things like that? So I think all together, those eight to 10 sort of details on a larger map are, are end up being unique. Mm -hmm. Aksang, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that anymore. You, you, already, you already said everything. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's good. I'm glad Haksang is here. He's keeping me honest. I had to catch up <laughs> with him, right? So I had to teach myself all of this after he did all this. So I'm glad you're here, Haksang. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions from the audience? Yeah, it was quite long discussion. Uh, a lot of questions. Yes, no, that was that was great. It's always it, always fun. The, the topic is so interesting, and your uh, demonstrations achievements are very impressive. Thank you, thank you. Well, that's all hacks on. I have to say, you know, all I did was get out of his way. Uh, it it also takes a teamwork to really achieve something. So, yes, uh, I helped along the way, but it was it was really his idea. And um, you know, at first yeah. I thought, oh, that's kind of a crazy idea. Yeah, that's okay. a brilliant idea, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but I, I think your suggestions are great, Olga. I think, I think in particular, larger particles, I think, you know, would, would, would make it both, you know, more cost-effective and possibly much brighter, right? And, and it, we could get around this issue of, you know, multiple colors by simply mixing different particles together um, and then using that, right? I think that would be mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, yeah. We will be uh, happy to collaborate in whatever way it is possible. Since okay. All right, Haxan, you can put that on your list. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you, Olga. Thank you so, so much for Absolutely. your uh, excellent presentation today. And uh, I hope to see you at some conferences in life. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It would be great to see you again. Thank you, Olga. Thank you again for the invitation. Okay. It was really great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Fantastic. And the great. discussion Thank was a lot you. of fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.